The first scripture today comes from Ecclesiastics 3, 1 through 13. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all shall eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. Second scripture, Revelations 21, 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I hear and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who, has, who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The third scripture, Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, that you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the external fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing sick and in prison and you did not visit me then they also will answer lord when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you then he will answer them truly i tell you just as you did not do it to one of the least of these you did not do it to me and these will go away into external punishment but the righteous will but the righteous into eternal life. This morning, 
let's all begin by relaxing just a little bit. Take a moment to find yourself in a comfortable position. Shake out your arms if you need to. Maybe don't close your eyes if you were up for New Year's. But take a moment and breathe in deep. And then breathe back out. Take another, breath, take another deep breath in and let it back out again. Keep breathing in and out. And for a moment, just focus on that breathing. Focus on this fundamental act of life. In and out. Notice that if you hold your breath for too long, or you breathe out for too long, that your body actually begins to strain against that. Breathing is not an either-or act. It is a both-and act. In and out. You have to have both. It's the combination of the in and the out that sustains life. It is the rhythm of in and out that gives us the ability to live at all. Sometimes in, this, in our lives, this rhythm of in and out goes completely unnoticed. We don't pay attention to it at all. But other times, we're incredibly aware of it. Usually when that rhythm of in and out is interrupted. Other times, like this morning, we can take the time to intentionally focus our attention on that breathing, to reconnect with the in and the out that is the basic necessity for life. The rhythm of breathing is essential for our life, but when it comes to our lives as a follower of Jesus, there is another rhythm that is just as essential. There is this rhythm of in and out of the Christian life that we have to have in order to to live a life that is truly Christian. This movement in and out takes a number of different forms and involves a whole range of activities, but it's a rhythm that we have to have. It may be unconscious at points, and it may be something that we pay very close attention to, but this rhythm of in and out is essential for the life as individuals as a Christian, but also as a Christian community. On one hand, there's this movement inward that is essential to our Christian life. As individuals and as a a whole community, and as I said, it takes many different forms and involves a whole bunch of different activities. Sometimes it may be personal Bible study or prayer or even things like solitude or personal reflection. Other times this movement inward may come through our our corporate worship, like what we're doing today, or or maybe through fellowship meals or through small groups or, or even through pastoral care. And by that, I don't just mean what I do as a pastor, but the pastoral caring of each other that we do as a congregation. There are all of these moves inward that are essential for life as a Christian. These are the moves where we find comfort and healing and personal growth and community and self-care. These are the moves that build up the church. And make no mistake, all of these moves inward are essential for experiencing the presence of Christ and walking the path of faith. But also make no mistake that just as you cannot breathe in forever, you also cannot always be spending your time and energy moving inward as well. The Christian life also requires the movement out into the world, out of the comfort of the church and out into the real world, so to speak. And again, I think this takes a number of different forms, at least that I see happening in our church community. The movement outward might mean something as simple as the way you go about the work at your job and doing that in a different kind of way. It might mean things like building relationships with your neighbors or hanging out at a coffee shop to get to know new people. It also might mean things like working with Family Promise 
for our relationship with Progressive Missionary Baptist Church and, and the Beyond Tolerance movement and the anti-racism work that, that we have found ourselves a part of. It might mean working with refugees or immigrants and welcoming them, welcoming them into our community. It also might mean things like service projects, Brethren Disaster Ministries, or, or uh, a group of people rebuilding a porch here in Wichita or, or around doing things around the world. It also might mean things like advocacy. And by that I mean using the voice that we might have to speak for those whose voices are not being listened to or being heard. It can mean a whole range of different things. But there are these things that we as individuals and as a whole church do where we are reaching out into the world to have an influence on people and systems around us. There's this movement out that is every bit as essential as the movement inward. But also, just as we only have a finite amount of breath to breathe out, so too we cannot always be moving outward without running out of energy and life that allows us to do that work in the first place. There is this distinct movement inward and outward. And both of those movements are essential to the Christian life. And when we have this healthy rhythm of in and out, those movements fuel and sustain each other. They keep us breathing and healthy in our Christian life. And without one or the other, that life truly cannot be sustained. It's the rhythm between the two of them that sustains our life and energy as Christians. Now, this rhythm shouldn't be all that surprising to us because it's something that is, well, not particularly new. This has been around for a very long time. In the Bible, we see this showing up all over the place. In the Gospels, we see this rhythm as a core part of what it means to be a disciple. I mean, Jesus calls a group of people inward to Himself and calls them disciples and teaches them what it means to follow Him and then He sends them back outward into the world to connect with and call new people who they then call inwards towards Jesus who then get sent back out again to call more people in and out. This rhythm of in and out is part of the essence of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Even older than that, we can go back to the book of Ecclesiastes and see this rhythm as well. Now, if you don't know, Ecclesiastes is a bit of a strange book. Um, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes is the book of the Bible that begins, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Why do people toil? <clears throat> why, why do people... Sorry. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they work under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes and the earth stays the same. I mean, the main point of the book of Ecclesiastes is essentially, yeah, might as well enjoy whatever lot you have in life and, you know, eat, drink, and be merry because it doesn't really get any better than that. And, you know, do what God wants and it'll probably work out for the best. It's, it's kind of a depressing book <laughs> if, you, if you read through it. There are actually some spectacular gems of wisdom in the book, though. One of which is the scripture that we have for today. And, if most of you are like me, and I'd put a pretty good bet that you are, you don't actually know this scripture from the Bible. You probably know this scripture from the wonderful 60's band, The Birds, and their song, Turn, Turn, Turn. Do everything, turn, turn. The text of that song is this scripture from... Ecclesiastes. The wisdom that the birds picked up on, but that the writer of Ecclesiastes really brings out here, is that there is this, there's this rhythm of life. There, there are these seasons in life. It, it's the in and the out. It, it's not, and it's not really about trying to hang on to any one of these particular seasons in life, but rather it's about understanding those rhythms and knowing where you are in that rhythm of life. Life is found in the rhythm, in the cycle, in the back and forth, in the in and the outs. The idea 
that life is most fully lived, or, or even more specifically, the idea that the life of following God is most fully lived in the rhythm of moving in and out, that is an idea that is really old. It goes back thousands of years, and in fact, I would even say that, that it's that rhythm that's built into what it means to be a human. Ecclesiastes shows us this rhythm. and shows us that it's a key part of life. But there's also something in our Scripture for today that I find very interesting, particularly, where we, particularly for where we sit today, at the beginning of a new year. In verses 10 and 11, the writer says, I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. I have seen the business that God has given everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. As I reflected on the beginning of a new year and this particular verse, what this points to for me is is the idea that God gives us tasks for particular times and places, which means that our job is not just to figure out what is God calling us to do in general, but rather the question is, what is God calling us to do in this time, in this place, here and now, in this part of the rhythm? What is the work that we need to be attending to? Today is January 1. It's the beginning of a new year time when we often reflect on the past and dream for the coming year. And as we take this moment to reflect and to dream, I think we should take our cue from the book of Ecclesiastes. We need to ask this question, where are we in the rhythm of life and what is the business that God has given to us to attend to? To answer that question, I think we can look at our two other scriptures for this morning from the book of Revelation and the Gospel of Matthew. Now interestingly, both the Revelation Scripture and the Matthew Scripture are end times Scriptures. They they are painting this picture of what they think the end of the world is going to look like and what the judgment of the world is going to look like. And in both of them, what I find interesting is that, that yes, there's this end of the world scene, but it's also very tied to the here and the now. In Revelation, it's worth noting that heaven is described not as a group of people going off to some other place, but rather heaven is described as a new holy city that is coming down here to earth. Heaven and the kingdom that goes along with it is, is something that comes to us, not somewhere else that we go to. Another way to say it is that, that getting to heaven is not so much about being extracted from this world and going to another place, but it's Well, it's about this world being transformed into the world that God has always wanted it to be. Which to me makes a lot of sense when you look at the Gospel of Matthew. Yes, in the the Matthew Scripture, there is this scene where there's this reward and punishment in the afterlife. But look closely here at what actions are getting rewarded and punished. What is the question that Jesus is asking? It's not about whether you sang the right songs or prayed the right prayers. It's not whether you've worn a divot into the church pew because you've sat in the same place for your whole life. It's not about whether you had the right last name or whether you were even well respected among people. When Jesus comes to reward and punish, the question is, when you saw somebody who was hungry, did you feed them? Or when they were thirsty, did you give them something to drink? When you saw a stranger, did you welcome them in? When someone was naked, did you give them clothes? When they were sick, did you care for them? When they were in prison, did you visit them? Those are the questions that Jesus asks in this scene. And what's more, the reason that he asks those questions is because he goes on to say that whenever we do those things for anybody else, that we're actually doing them for him. When we do those things for anybody else, we are doing them for Jesus. That is a truth that, that this week uh, has been made crystal clear to me in a way that I'm not sure that it ever really has before. Last Sunday, on Christmas Day, 
in the morning, we celebrated the birth of Jesus, our Savior, who was born in a barn because his family couldn't find a place to sleep. That evening, we opened our doors to a group of families who were desperately looking for a place to sleep. I don't know about you, but at least for me, it has been crystal clear that this past week when we have had these families from Family Promise here, we, we didn't open our doors to a group of homeless families. We have been hosting none other than Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. This week has been one of those moments in my life where I can say without a shadow of a doubt <clears throat> that when we have fed clothed, welcomed in, visited with, given a drink of water to, and cared for this group of people that we have absolutely done it for nobody else than Jesus. As we look towards 2017 and we ask, what is the mission of God that, call, mission of God that, that we are being called to today? I have to say that I have found a tremendous amount of clarity over the last month or so. For starters, scriptures like the one from Revelation are a reminder that our job as Christians is to participate in the kingdom of God. And that that kingdom of God is a here and now kind of thing. It is among us, as Jesus would say. It is not somewhere else, it is now. And it is here. And then, scriptures like Matthew and other experiences that I think we've had as a church recently have reaffirmed that, that as we... That, the way that we participate in the kingdom of God is by being involved with things that serve the most vulnerable people in this world. Which means that as we look towards 2017, I would simply say that our job, our business that God has given us to do, is to attend well to the rhythm of life that allows us to do the work of the kingdom. We need to attend well to that rhythm. In 2017, we need to attend to these different parts of the Christian life that both as individuals and as, as a whole church that allow us to be a part of the kingdom. And of course, I mean some more specific things by this. I mean three main areas that I think we need to attend to or at least continue to attend to. Of course, there is the moving in part of, of the rhythm. There's the reaching out part, and there is the part where we invite others into that rhythm. And yes, while I would say that each of us need to reflect on what it means to attend to these areas personally, I will also say that as a congregation, within each of these areas, I see some even more specific things that, that I would hope that we continue to give some time and energy to. When talking about moving in, the three areas that I see uh, as important are caregiving, small groups, and intentional relationships. More and more I'm seeing a need for a group of people besides me to do the work of caregiving, of visitation, and, and those kinds of things um, for our congregation. It's one of the things that is the glue that can hold us together. In addition to that, it's important to continue our small groups and give those some time and attention as a way to study the Bible together, to pray with each other, and as a path for new people to really build some relationships and enter into the community of this congregation. And in general, I think it's important for all of us to attend to the work of forming intentional Christian relationships. I think we actually do a very good job as, of forming friendships and relationships, but it's important for those to be relationships where our Christian life is furthered together. And we often do that very well, but it's important to give that intention. In terms of reaching out, the three big areas that I see, at least right now, are Family Promise, Progressive Missionary Baptist, and the work of advocacy. And, and honestly, this to me, this is only a slice of what we already do and, and what we will continue to do. And, and honestly, this stuff doesn't feel particularly new to me. This is all very in keeping with just who we are as a congregation. I mean, yeah, some of this is new in terms of this time in this place, but 
but if you think about it, really the fundamental impulse of our congregation and of our denomination as a whole is to basically do what, well, what Jesus said in Matthew 25. I mean, we, we go out and we, we serve others, serve those in need, we build relationships with them, and then once we do that, we speak out on their behalf when we can. That's the reason Heifer Project exists, that Brethren Disaster Ministries exist, that, that people from this congregation have done service for their entire lives It's the reason that we've had thrift shops and all kinds of other things associated and made possible through this congregation. That's just kind of what we do. This just happens to be the things that are in front of us today. The third area, then, is inviting others into the rhythm. The thing about this is is that it's important to remember that, that anybody can enter into that rhythm at any point in the cycle. Sometimes it may come through friendships or through worship or through uh, joining in a service project or some other thing we're doing in the community. But anybody can join at any point in that cycle. Our job, then, is to invite others into that rhythm wherever that might be. And by our job, I do mean everybody (laughs) connected with this church. It's not something that just one or two people can do. We all are the ones who are the hands and the feet of Jesus. And I think it's important to do it with intention. Sometimes it just happens, other times it doesn't. We need to make sure that we are focused on that. As we look towards 2017, I have to say, I find myself being tremendously excited and very, very hopeful about what God is doing in this group of people and through this group of people, and even in in our city and and our surrounding area as well. Yeah, there are some things that we need to attend to to make sure that we continue to be a healthy congregation and having this rhythm of moving in and out, but that's the normal stuff of being, being a church. For whatever challenges we might face, I consistently see God doing amazing things in the lives of individuals in this congregation and through the lives of all of us. I'm very, very excited for what 2017 holds because of what God is doing. I hope you are too. So this morning, my my simple prayer is that may God lead us into the future. And may God do that May, and may we walk into the future with joy, with hope, with courage, and with love. Amen.